بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم The Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم He said إن الله لا ينظر إلى صوركم Indeed Allah doesn't look at your suar which is the plural of surah your image, your form that which superficially manifests from you not that Allah can't see it, but that's not where Allah places uh, uh, worth or ultimate value. And Allah la yandri la suwarikum wa la ila ajsadikum He doesn't look to your bodies. Kullukum in Adam wa Adam in Turab. You're all from Adam and Adam is from clay. He's from dirt, from, from soil. Turab. Walakin, however, rather, yandri ila qulubikum. He looks to your hearts. Or a more accurate translation, he rather he's looking to your hearts. Didn't just happen, it's happening now. Yandur ila qulubikum wa a'malikum. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said, Inna fil jasadi la mudra. Indeed, in the body is a clump of flesh. Either salahat, salaha jismu kullu. If it's rectified, the entire body becomes rectified. Not just the limbs, but one's behavior, one's intentions, one's orientation, one's focus, one's purpose, one's apprehension of meaning or lack thereof. The entire, the whole thing becomes rectified. And if it becomes corrupted, putrid, foul, soiled, ruined, then the entire body becomes right, becomes corrupted also. Is it not the heart? So what is the heart? The master of, this, of these sciences in this, this particular discipline, they would start by giving a definition that the heart is not what's referred to as um, this clump of flesh this organ, this blood pump, situated towards the left-hand side of a human being's chest, which fulfills a bodily function. It's an organ, just like the liver, just like the brain. Just like That's not what we're talking about here when we say qalb. Rather, it's talking about something different. It's something that has the capacity to be changed and to be refined. And its centrality cannot be underestimated. So in his book, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah ta'ala, Kamiyat al-Sa'ada, The Alchemy of Happiness. And once again, we're taking selected chapters from this text and we're building around it. He starts when, in one of the chapters when he talks about Ma'rifat al-Nafs. اعلم أن مفتاح معرفة المعرفة الله تعالى هو معرفة النفس. Know that the key to معرفة, which is a particular kind of knowledge, it's an experiential knowledge. It's a form of recognition. It's a form of accurate, pure conceptualization of what's real. Being in tune with reality and the real, al-haq subhanahu wa ta'ala. The key to this, the key to this opening, the key to this deepening, huwa ma'rifat al-nafs. It's knowing the self. Kama qala subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah says in the Quran, sanurihim ayatina, sayunurihim ayatina fi al-afaqi wa fi anfusihim. We will show them our signs upon the horizons. And in their, in them, their selves, in themselves, in you, is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Until it becomes 
purely manifest that this is real and the scholars of tafsir talk about what this dhamir who what's it referring to some of them said the prophet muhammad the reality of this affair the quran so on and so forth man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbahu أن هذه العبارة ليست من حديث النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وإنما هي من قول يحيى ابن معاذ الرازي رحمه الله تعالى. So this is a saying from Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi رحمه الله تعالى. من عرف نفسه the one that knows himself or themselves. And we're not just talking about they kind of get what your your identity or your soup, the way you act or the way you behave. The very essence of who you are, the one that knows the essence of who they are. Indeed, they've known their Lord. The more we're able to be aware, self aware, the more we're able to be aware and externalize and objectify broader realities. وَلَيْسَ الشَّيْءَ أَقْرَبِ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ نَفْسِكَ And there's nothing closer to you than your own self. There's nothing closer to you than you. فَإِذَا لَمْ تَعْرِفْ نَفْسَكَ فَكَيْفَ تَعْرِفْ رَبَّكَ So if you don't know yourself, how are you going to know your Lord? How are you going to know the source of all existence? فَإِنْ قُلْتَ he understands that we're going to be asking these questions. These things are going to come to the surface. Were you to say, I know myself. I know myself. I'm aware. I get who I am. I know my identity. I know where I fit in the world. All you know is just something to do with your outward identity. The way you project. The way you appear or want yourself to appear to the world. All you know is something from the outward shell. الذي هو اليد والرجل والرأس والجثة. It's your hand, you know, your leg, your head and your torso. You know something about that. And you don't know the reality of the essence of you. What's in your bautin. لا إله إلا الله. And he says, so it's, you've got to really get to know yourself, your reality, who you really are. It's an imperative to do so. حتى تدرك أي شيء أنت. So you, so you really start to perceive and understand who you are. And where you came from. To this place. How did you arrive in this place? And for what reason were you brought here? And to know how to be happy and to know to be un- how, what causes you unhappiness. SubhanAllah. And then he says this is part of a, uh, you could say like a, an Islamic uh, psych- psychology in terms of the diagnosis of the components of the human soul. وَقَدْ جَمَعْتَ فِي بَاطِنِكْ صِفَاتِ You have um, certain attributes within you, culminated within your being. Or you could say tendencies. In your in yourself, there are tendencies. Some of them, sifat al bahain. These are tendencies which you share with the animal kingdom, with the animal world. You know, wild animals. Wa min has sifat al sibaa. وَمِنْهَا صِفَاتُ الشَّيَاطِينَ وَمِنْهَا صِفَاتُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ لا إله إلا الله You also have within you these tendencies, it's like a, like a wild animal. He has this, these incredible metaphors. And you, there, are, there are canine tendencies within a human being. You know. And there are uh, serpent-like tendencies within a human being predatory tendencies which cause you to you know seek out your appetites it's all part wrapped up within our 
ourselves. And some of them are similar to the shayateen within them. There are tendencies which have not, they're not tended to. They can become like the shayateen. Some of them also have a similitude to the angelic realm. Angels are uh, 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 beings in their, their ultimate form is not disclosed to most human beings. That's why in Islam we don't draw them. Because ultimately it would be a trivialization, a trivializing of the beauty of what an angel is. Not a cupid with wings. But we know their essence of their creation is from light. And they have certain attributes. فالروح حقيقة جوهرك So your soul or your heart or yourself in its reality is the, the real gem, it's the essence of your existence. And everything else you know, is centered around it. You, know. you could say it's not integral to your reality. And he says, so you've got to know this. Because this is also how we define happiness. How do we understand what happiness is? People are seeking happiness. Everyone wants to be happy. But we've got to understand what's the definition of happiness before we even think of a methodology of how to understand it. Maybe people may say, you know, I feel really happy when I do such and such a thing. But maybe that feeling which you're experiencing is temporary, is fleeting. Is that happiness something which ultimately goes and is fleeting? These are all questions we should ask ourselves. He said there's a form of happiness or contentment, sa'ada, which is experienced by the rest of the animal kingdom, by the Baha'im, by wild beasts. And that's in eating, drinking. You know. And procreating. He says if you want to be like them, then that's what you've got to get on with doing. Just try and eat loads and drink loads, and that you'll find happiness just like they find happiness. And predatory animals, they have this exhilaration. It's like an adrenaline you know, in, in you know, pouncing. And if you want to be like this, do what they do. And you'll be happy in the way that they're happy. And the contentment, it's like a devilish, by the very essence, meaning of the word contentment of the shayateen is in makr and shar with hiyal is in plotting and planning and scheming so if you want to taste something of the happiness that the shayateen feel busy yourself with that go and plot and plan and scheme if you're one of them busy yourself with that with what they busy themselves with. وَسَعَادَةِ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Now we're going to a different uh, part of the spectrum of, of Allah's creation. The happiness, and I'm using this term very lightly, sa'ada, the bliss, the joy, the real ultimate happiness. These aren't flimsy words when they're used by such people. You know, it's not just a, a moment of excitement or you know, trip on a roller coaster or Whatever it may be. We're talking about real happiness. Of the malaika, of the angelic bodies. في مشاهدة جمال حضرة الربوبية is in the continual, absolute, beautiful, manif witnessing of the beauty of the divine presence. So look deep, he says, into your essence. What do you want to be like? What do you want to resemble? What kind of happiness do you want to have? He says, Nafs huwa al-qalb alladhi ta'rifu bi'ayn al-baatin So the, the heart of which we're talking about here, which is the, the way to achieve that ultimate happiness, the most elated form of happiness. And this is why, as human beings, we have the potential to sink to the lowest of the low. And why is it the lowest of the low? Because an animal is not taken into account for being an animal. Chewing the cud, that's all a cow can do. 
But a human being, Allah has placed within this sirr, this potential to, be able to, potential to be able to ascend, to seek that which is greater. You know, if somebody has a very keen intellect and they don't study, they don't learn, it's almost a waste. If somebody has the gift of wealth and they don't use it for that which is good, it's a waste. And ultimately it's a dismissal of a gift. And the greatest gift is potential to come close to Allah, to know Allah. So the qalb, the heart, you know it through the the bi'ayn al batin your inner eye. That's how you can feel it. That's how you can feel its existence. And we have this in, in language, even in a seemingly secular you know, society. I felt this, I inclined towards this. And these are not always rationalized things. There are things going on deep within us that we're able to approach upon a methodology which was laid down to us for the Prophet Sallallahu We'll have these things trained, we'll have these things unlocked. And this is the reality of your inner construct. This is what we call the, the qalb, the heart. And one of the reasons, as they say, why it's called qalb, it's because it's constantly rotating. Qallaba means to, to rotate. The heart is constantly reorienting. One morning, you can wake up and you feel that you're, you're channeling to and you're, being, you're receiving a, a flow of goodness from a particular source. And then midway through the day, you flow to a different source. And then the others. It's the nature of the heart. So how do we place it in a place of balance and orient it towards that which can be channeled? to a channel which is healthy you know, and invigorating and empowering and ultimately pulling us back to what's, what's real, to al-haq. This is what's called the qalb. So they can be, can be synonymous, can mean the same thing. Qalb, ruh, the heart, the soul, the self, even the nafs. And he says, وَلَيْسَ الْقَلْبِ we're not talking about that thing which you can, you can monitor, which you can feel in the left-hand side of your chest. That's not what we're talking about here. Because you can find this in other created beings, not just a human being, and you can find it in a dead human being. There's still a heart there. We're talking about approximating something else which is not there in in those things. وَكُلُّ شَيْءٍ تَبْصِرُهُ بِعَيْنَ الظَّاهِرِ فَهُوَ مِنْ هَذَا الْعَالَمِ This is once again Imam al-Ghazali from the beginning reconstructing a world view for us. Everything that you can see, and we're not just talking about by the human eye, anything that you can test for under a microscope, anything that you can test for empirically, basically. This is just from this part of the world, through this veneer. This slither of alam al shahada the witnessed world, that which can be is palpable and tangible. That's not what we're talking about. It is Amma Haqiqatan Qalb, as for the reality of the heart, Falaysa min al alam It's not from this world. SubhanAllah. So you have something within you right now which is not part of this world. It's a mystical reality within you that has a potential to be unlocked and cultivated and refined, which is not from this world. La ilaha illallah. لَكِنَّهُمْ مِنْ أَعْلَمِ الْغَيْبِ فَهُوَ فِي هَذَا الْعَالِمِ غَرِيبِ So within this world, because we exist within this world, we have a tangible existence. Gravity. You know, we can feel, we can touch. We're often veiled by our senses. It's gharib. It feels like a foreigner. This part, this spiritual organ within you feels like a foreigner in this world. It feels estranged. Gharib. feels out of place. And the ultimate uh, goal of this is to get back into that place of recognition and realization. But that takes work. He says so you have to start to struggle against the soul. Work against the nafs, purify the heart. Because this is a Johar Aziz, it's a it's a majestic gift. It's a it's a it's a 
it's this, part, this essence within you is of the same form as something that the malaika have the capacity to do or have, have the capacity to behold you rem resemble that and it's the source of ma'adin min hadrat al-ilahiyya you can say like the, the treasures of witnessing the divine presence these are very very high words there's no doubt but this isn't a small affair this is an epic thing and as for your question, not the time he preempts. I know you're thinking this is what you're thinking right now. What's the reality of the heart? What is it really about? There is nothing greater that has come in the, def the definition of the heart and the ruh and this, the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. And they ask you, when they came and asked the Prophet about the ruh, and in this context we're talking about the same thing, the soul, the heart, the reality of yourself. They're asking you, what is this thing? What is the soul? Say that the, the soul is from the affair of my Lord. And then he starts to talk about the importance of the reason for this intentional absence of disclosure, this mystery, which has not been unveiled to the human being. You know, part of it is its complexity and its sophistication and its reality is too difficult for us to comprehend. We're not able to have isti'ad to, to understand it in its entirety, but just to know how important this affair is to you. So the Prophet ﷺ taught us this alchemy, spiritual alchemy, which is the transformation of, of a base, worthless, uh, material substance into something of worth. And the reason why you, could, you have to add these things on in English, we say spiritual, is because we're not just talking about turning lead into gold. We're talking about a triad and tested, proven methodology which the Prophet ﷺ brought to reawaken a heart which has maybe become dormant and because of the nature of it being foreign in this world has forgotten about its homeland it's forgotten about where it came from so the Prophet ﷺ taught us that this thing is real this thing exists and not only does it exist but I've come with a methodology a path which is inherently a journey. You have, to, you have to walk. You have to set forth upon this path. And because of the nature of the path, it has certain prere prerequisites. If we want to understand more about our hearts. If we want to understand that there are things which are, there are ailments, there are defects. You know, Imam al-Ghazali talks about how the heart one of the reasons why it sometimes it's unable to receive that signal back from its source is because it may not be facing in the right direction. Or it may be broken, like if you have a cup, it has cracks in it, and the water, you can pour it in, but it just falls out on the other side. Or the cup, right from the beginning, is turned on its head. So whatever you pour into it, it doesn't take in. So because of the profundity of what this is calling us to do, what the Prophet ﷺ is ultimately calling us to do, it has certain prerequisites. This path has certain prerequisites. You're not going to be able to traverse without them. And even if you're feel, feeling like you're moving forward, in reality we could be moving backwards. It's very subtle. And it's all related to adab. Adab, you could you know, perhaps render into uh, sacred courtesy. And it's to do with having an awareness within you that everything has its place, everything has its time, everything has its right, the right way of doing it. And it's orienting yourself inwardly also to who you're doing it for. Because Adab is not just etiquette 
it's connected, the right adab is the connection and the harmony between what you do and the way you behave and your inner state, your intention for why you behave that way, why you do what you do, who you're doing it for. That's adab. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ came to teach us. He said, Adabani Rabbi fa ahsana ta'dibi. Allah, my Lord taught me adab. He received it directly from Allah. Every breath of his وسلم, was adab. Every movement, every glancing of his blessed eyes, وسلم, every footstep, every word. And this, he was sent وسلم, as this great example, this archetype of adab. And he taught this to the Sahaba, to the people around him. It's not just, you know, make sure you sit this way, and, although there is a reality to that. Alhamdulillah, this is a primer, a session which is a primer into this science and, and just gaining some kind of awareness into some of the realities of the heart. But one of the adab tradition is people would be sat on the floor. We wouldn't be sat at desks. We wouldn't be sat on chairs. And if people find it difficult, yeah, then we, we accustom ourselves to getting used to it. That's part of the nature of the path. These things are connected. They create an ambience, they create a, uh, they, they hold things, these adab. Because they're not done haphazardly. They're not done for no reason. It's not just done because you didn't have a chairs and desks. They're done intentionally. And they're done in preservation of a tradition which comes all the way back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sat on his knees before Sayyidina Jibreel, he's teaching us adab. He's teaching us a way of receiving knowledge. Because ta'zim and reverence for this affair is pivotal to our understanding of it. If we don't have reverence, we don't have ta'zim for what this is to you and its implications fi deen wa dunya wal akhirah to everything you are. It's just relating bite-sized chunks of information. It has no real meaning. And it won't impact the soul. It won't hit the place. It won't pinpoint that thing that needs to be woken up. So you can be going through the motions for years. And that's what we don't want to do. We want to access, learn how to access those points. How to understand those things. Some people, they could hear the same thing. But why do different people understand things differently? Some of the shuk, they'd even say that when a, when a person was revising or learning and they faced the qibla, the direction for prayer. It's not an obligation, you don't have to do it. The adab, part of the adab of seeking, of, of a seeker of truth. You know, upon the path of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is that when you're revising or when you're in adhkar, that you face the qibla. They say they'd, they'd found openings greater than those people that never really paid any much concern with that. All it is is facing your physical being in a particular direction, but a special direction, a direction that has metaphysical realities that come back forth to you. And so much of the deen is سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We hear and we obey. And obedience is to the one, it's to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The one that came with absolute truth. It's not to somebody that's making things up. It's not someone who's, you know, just giving their philosophies, their ideologies, their opinions. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He's calling us. He saw this. He witnessed it. There's nobody that witnessed these realities more. And he's calling us back. And part of the beauty of his ways, he made it so easy. But for those that are attuned and attentive. And this is a sign of sincerity upon the one who's seeking truth. If you're a sincere seeker of truth and what's real, it will manifest. Because it comes from a love. It comes from a a place within you that is desperate to know more. And it puts everything else. The Sahaba didn't need to be taught adab. They, they, it, was, it came to them. There were subtle things, no doubt. You know, the Prophet وسلم, indicated you know, of how to pinpoint those access points of, of medad, of that you know, real flow back from the source, back from Al-Haq, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Back from Allah. But it... Their hearts were so impacted, it was so real to them, so cultivated, the reality of where they were going to. 
that you see these amazing things. Nobody told Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. You know, when the Prophet ﷺ was in the, 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 the entry, ground floor of the house. Sayyidina Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was, was on the floor above. Nobody told him, you know, radiallahu anhu, to walk in the corners of the room. That's not a, a religious obligation. You don't have to do that. But he knew who was there and he didn't want to even... There's a floor in between. He wasn't walking over the Prophet ﷺ. But it's a hot... It's, who is there? Who is downstairs? You know, and he walked around the corners of the room just out of, you know, love, love, love. That's Adip. And that's why they received what they received. They understood who he was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they placed their trust in him. So the method is the method of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how do we understand this? Because there are many claimants. Many claimants to truth, and there are many claimants to people that, you know, we have a methodology to what's, to what's real. This is a an institution and a reality which has been codified and preserved and articulated a senad which is a a process a lifelong process ultimately of transferal of knowledge of worldview of principles of understanding of meaning of how to understand things of how the heart should receive certain things from person to person, heart to heart, like an apprenticeship for an entire lifetime. And it started with those people around the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where you zaki him and he purifies them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just through teaching some you know, few lessons in psychology, a few kind of tips, one, two, three, do this. Just by being in his presence, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's the greatest, you know, purificatory thing. Reality, just being in his presence, Allah. And as those beings, they carried a light and it went to the Tabi'een, the people after the Sahaba that didn't meet the Prophet, that were believers and they took as their teachers, their mentors. They were disciples, they were apprentices to the Sahaba, the people who took directly from the Prophet, and then to the Tabi'een. And then after that, from the, to the elite of the Ummah. The elite or the elect, people that are chosen you know, to be a Muslim, alhamdulillah, you pray five times a day. And there are obligations within this. If you have arrogance in your heart, er you know, en envy in your heart, you know, these are an, it's a religious obligation to get rid of these things. But we're talking about people that this was a, you know, every breathing moment to be people who knew where they were going to, who understood the potentiality of the heart, and they spent their lives engaging with it in order to be something which is dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those people that bore that reality, that carried bearers of that reality, of the true wurrath, the inheritors of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only in that which they're able to quote, Sallu kama ra'itu muni He said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, praise you've seen me pray. So part of Senate is understanding that we have a methodology of how to pray. And we need to learn this is a fard ayn. It's an individual obligation to know how to pray, what breaks the prayer, what necessitates wudu, so on and so forth. But also the inner workings of the prayer. How do we cultivate awe and presence in the prayer? How do we understand that the prayer in reality is an opportunity to reconnect back to that source, to plug into that reality? Now, Allah doesn't need our prayer. We need it. Allah doesn't say, pray the prayer, establish the prayer. Aqeem salah establish the reality, root the prayer down in your life, in your heart. No. La ilaha illallah. So these are the inheritors of prophecy, these people. Are. And through this, we're able to open up channels to receive back from that first source. And what we're talking about here, the spiritual opening is what's often known as medad. Because we're going to need this. If we're going to go through a process, there's going to be times we're going to feel a bit, you know, 
our resolve and ambition is going to be lacking. We're going to have our ups and downs. It's the nature of the human being. We've got to be real with ourselves. But the essence, and one of the things I wanted to, in this opening session, mention something about is the reality of one of the most important adab, one of the most important and essential uh, courtesies in this process and this journey upon this path. Without which, all of the, the other teachings, they're not going to ring true. They're not going to resonate. And that which doesn't resonate is not going to put things into harmony. You're not going to feel that resonance in your heart. You don't have these things. You could be learning through these. And that's not, we're not interested in doing this. It's another course about, you know, yeah, it's bad. Everyone knows it's bad to envy. Everyone knows it's bad to be arrogant. Everyone knows it's bad to be prideful. Why are we here? To look deep down within ourselves. Do I have some kind of baqaya, some kind of re remnants of this? How do I take it out? And if I take it out, what does that look like? And what does that result in? And what am I ultimately able to receive as a process of going through this methodology? One of the shiur said, there are two qualities that there is nothing greater, n nothing better than them if, they, if they're found within a human being. And it's husna dhan billah wa husna dhan bi ibadillah. Now, husna dhan is often translated as having a good opinion, which you could say is, is a fair translation. Husn is also re related to beauty. And it doesn't mean giving someone the benefit of the doubt. It's to do with an inward orientation of your heart, channeling back to that person to know that you're able to trust and receive in terms of teaching. Husnavan billah. Scholars have spoken about this. Is to have a high esp an estimation of Allah that is befitting of him. And Staff, we don't know what's, what's befitting of Allah. We can never do worship Allah in accordance to that which is befitting of Him. And there are an elect group of people, people whose hearts have been cultivated. The khasa. Hasanu dhan bihi lamma limahu alayh min ni'ut al-saniya wa sifat al-aliyya. So their form of hasanu dhan in Allah, to have the, the most beautiful estimation of God. Is because of what they've tasted and experienced of Him, because of who He is, not because of what they receive from Him. Understand? They are people of the Arafullah. They they know Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Obviously, nobody can know Allah in His entirety Subhanahu Wa Taala. But the Arif, the person who is you know, who's turned to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and engaged upon this path, they know Allah through that which they. Allah is this. That's why I have a good opinion of Him. And that's why a person with that heart, they're not able to turn away from him. They don't have iltifat. They can't be distracted. In fact, they're distracted by him from everything else. So you see them and they look at something, but they're thinking of Allah and they're experiencing Allah and they're yearning for Allah. That's a state. It's a reality. The people in this ummah ex exist and they have these realities. Don't know. In terms of the amma, the generality of the believers, what's, what we're called upon to do is to have a good opinion of Allah. And typically what that means is to see that which comes from Him. You see, the, look at the blessings. And the Prophet ﷺ taught this. Love Allah from that which He gives you in terms of your blessings. So how do we increase in having a good opinion of Allah? By increasing in in gratitude. And this is going to be something which we can talk about uh, in the forthcoming sessions. The importance of gratitude you know, and the danger of when a person goes into a state of ingratitude and gratefulness. So, in a very pr uh, practical level, just to say Alhamdulillah frequently. In the you know, early scriptures, this is how the, the, the Ummah, the nation of the, the end times, were described. Alhamdulillah. People, they're always praising Allah. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Kif al Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Something very unique to the Ummah of the Prophet But it's not just a cultural word. It's not just, it, means, it doesn't mean I'm alright. 
but in an Arabic Muslim type cultural setting. It means Alhamdulillah. You feel it, you connect it, and you really praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to contemplate upon the blessings of Allah and to thank Him for it is one of the greatest ways to cultivate love of Allah in the heart. La ilaha illallah. Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, he says, Man ahab an yakhtim lahu bi khair fal yahsin al-dhan bin nas. If a person wants their life to be sealed in a good way, basically when their soul is take, taken at the last pivotal moment before death, then you should have the high estimation of everyone else. La ilaha illallah. So husn al-dhan, this is something that can often be challenging. when we've grown up in societies which often veer towards cynicism, which often veer towards what can often be a healthy skepticism. It's healthy, you need it, it's a survival tactic. If you're not gonna be cynical and skeptical, you're gonna be duped. Because we're used to institutions, we're used to claims, we're used to charlatans. We've got the truth, we got the answer, we've got that. Yeah, I've heard that before. The heart can become hard. And we should not paste that Survival technique ultimately upon the deen. What we do within the deen is we have a clear methodology, as we said, with Senate. Not anyone that has no van, it happens to a lot of people when they become Muslim. They think that every Muslim is worthy of you know, rece- you know, giving advice. And what can happen very frequently is a person is pushed from pillar to post and they waste a lot of time and they waste a lot of potential and a lot of energy both physical and spiritual, and they get burnt out. So what's husn al To have a good opinion of people. You have a good opinion of people. Even if a person does something which you know is haram, which you know is wrong, even if they're acting in a foul way, it's a religious obligation for us to have husn al What we don't say is maybe what they're doing is, maybe it's a figment of my imagination. We don't, we're not called to live in a kind of another reality. No, you see that? If you're able to rectify it, then you do so. But with husnadan in the heart, having a good estimation of that person in the heart. And what that means is, even if this person is in this state, then I have a good estimation of Allah. You see how it's connected? That Allah will change this person. I have a hope in Allah. Allah will change this person for the better. They'll die and they're, they're, no doubt in, they're, they're better than me. And they no, no doubt do things which are far better than I do. And there are many things which I do are foul, which they probably don't do. So it cultivates humility in the heart, which is once again for coming sessions, and something we can explore further. What it also doesn't mean is every person ha- have their, their ikhtisas, their particular specialization. A person can be a, a person of God and then maybe have certain things which they're not particularly good at. It doesn't mean that they're God and they can do all things. That you know, infallibility is reserved for the prophets and the awliya and the salihin are not infallible. They're mahfudin, they have a divine protection. So typically if they do slip or err, they're very quick to going back to what's right. So we shouldn't judge people. However, if somebody walks down the street, their car breaks down. Just You don't, you don't go to any Muslim you know, or anyone else and say, could you help me fix my car? out of Hasnaban, well maybe they know, they probably have a good opinion of them. That's great, but that's not their ikhtisas, that's not their specialization. There may be a person that's dear to Allah because it's not stipulated to be dear to Allah to be a mechanic. Although a mechanic can also be someone who's a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once again, it's this world view. It doesn't mean that we have a bad, you know, I thought you could do everything and you can't because you can't fix my car. That's not their area of specialization. None. Everything, everything, everything has its adab. Now, what can happen is if these things aren't cultivated, something can creep in called, which is su'avan, which is the opposite. And this is a pivotal adab upon, you know, we're not going to understand other things. If we, we can go through sessions, which inshallah in the forthcoming sessions we're going to be going, going through, we can talk about, you know, how arrogant. 
arrogance, conceit, attachment to the ephemeral world, you know, stinginess, miserliness, ingratitude, seeking fame and status, trust, you know, agitation, all of these things. If we don't look and understand these knowledges through the prism of having a good opinion of where this knowledge is coming from, it's going to have a very little resonance on the heart. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to, to benefit from this alchemy which these, these, these masters of this discipline preserved and codified and sacrificed for us. Yeah. And we're, we're here to remind ourselves. We're here to remember ultimately where we came from and where we're going back to. So if we were able to cultivate a state of husnaban, a beautiful opinion within our heart, it moves away from the potential of insecurities coming into the soul. A lot of the time people have insecurities, but it's rooted in that su'aban. They think this of me. I bet they're saying, thinking this about me. And it's based upon su'aban, a bad opinion. And it's not going to help us. And the reason why when we engage in this science that we have a high estimation, we have an edip when we engage in, in this knowledge is not for the person teaching the knowledge, in essence. Al-madad ala qadr al-mashhad Your spiritual nourishment, what you receive, the change, the, the flow which allows you that great reality, your heart to be unlocked, you know, is all in the way, the, your, your mashhad, your view of things. We have adab for the knowledge, and we have the adab for the source of the knowledge. And if we do this, then the knowledge will start to flow. And we become in a state of bust, which is, you could say, is one of the spiritual states of expansion. We're able to receive this knowledge with reverence to where it came from, with reverence to who ultimately is teaching it. That's where we're getting this knowledge from. And if it's from other than the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, we don't need it. That's not part of our methodology. It's a bid'ah. What we want is the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the sunnah is the way back to the real, back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Typically the mashayikh, the bearers of the, this tradition, that's the state they want us to be in, a state of bust. Because the opposite is a state of qabd. Qabd means, means constriction. And the more our souls are constricted, and the little we're able to receive. And you have examples of this even within this you know, within secular culture. Sometimes, I'm not feeling the creative flow. Really what they're talking about is you're in a state of spiritual qabd. You're munqabil. You're in a state of, because these things are also related. You know, creativity is also related. What's called creativity is related to the soul. It's related to something deeper. So the ability to join between the abstract and see things, and, you know, which aren't typically disclosed. So we need to be in a state of bust. And what I'd recommend before these sessions, and we're going to be doing this here, if people could take a few moments just to prepare their heart. Maybe you could take some and do some dhikr, do some adhkar, and think about their intentions for being here. Because what we want to be doing is having our hearts oriented for this short amount of time, in this short part of the day, a few times a week. And to engage within this science, and to have unlocked for us and through us some of these realities to get our hearts in gear, to get our hearts re-engaged to have our hearts awoken uh, to the reason why they were created so may Allah give us tawfiq mm -hmm. and may Allah grant us adab inwardly and outwardly with him, with his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and with these blessed teachings which his inheritors were given and entrusted to them until this time wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين